Are you working in a nonprofit but having to work extra jobs just to make ends meet? Do you want to make a difference in the world but are completely burnt out from overwork and underpayment? Do you wish you could leverage your passions to change the world but on your own terms, having the flexibility to travel and make the money you are looking to make? This is the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. We are building a network of global activists and empowering you to have the freedom to have a thriving business, making an impact in the world without burnout. Hello, everyone, and welcome or welcome back to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Lisa Mayaka Bartlett. She is the founder of three social service enterprises in the past two decades to empathically support traumatized and vulnerable populations. She is a child welfare and trauma expert with degrees in theology, business management, slash entrepreneurship, and social work. Lisa, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, Tiffany, thank you for having me. I sound good on paper. I'm sure your story is because that's what I'm going to ask you next is about your story, because I'm sure you absolutely sound good in your story as well, because I really want to hear about how you were called to the work that you're doing. Oh, my goodness. Okay, that is a long story for the sake of time and your audience. Let me package it this way. I do use my middle name now. Um, I use it professionally and I've named my organization Lisa Mayaka Incorporated because the name actually means oppressed. And it comes from a story out of the Old Testament, my mom and grandma being of Christian faith. And this woman named Maaka, which meant oppressed in Hebrew, was not to be married to a king, and yet she was. So she was already outside the box of what society allowed. She was traumatized and made fun of by the society in which she lived. She gave birth to a son who ended up hanging himself. And uh, she was tied to the great King David of biblical lore. And so from day one, out of the gate, I was named Lisa, which comes from Elizabeth and means, you know, called by God. And then my middle name means oppressed. (laughs) And so I have actually lived through quite a few personal traumas. We understand that word so much better now through neuroscience and psychology and so many wonderful research works that are done. But the lens of my own life and life experiences became very salient to me when I was studying social work in my 40s. But I'd already lived through so many things and passed on some of that generational stuff to five children that I had by the age of 27. And so you know, I think our life calls us to our work if we're listening. And oftentimes we don't really start listening till much later or through frustrations in, you know, trying on other jobs for size or getting degrees and things our parents tell us to, and then it doesn't align with our soul. And so we quit and try something else. So when I found social work or social work found me at 42, I found my reason for existence. I had always felt called outside of myself to help others. And I tried in a lot of ways, traveled overseas to support orphans, particularly in Ukraine. I have done a lot of kind of in the streets outreach work, but not until I got to Case Western Reserve University and the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences did I find my purpose. And not that I'm living it fully yet, because I'm still have decades left of whatever I do next. But I mean, I really don't know what I want to be when I grow up. The joy that I have right now is I'm in touch with an inner child that didn't get what she needed when she needed it. And now I get to give that to her. And in doing that, I come alive in a way that I can truly and authentically give to others. And so that is the call on my life now. And that's the work that I do now. That is absolutely beautiful. And I know that it can be very scary when you hear that this is what you should be doing. And you're like, how? What do you mean? Why? Me? No. (laughs) So how did you navigate that when you started to feel this calling towards social work or social work calling you? Let's just be honest. I had train wrecked my life and I was getting a degree at 37, 38 because my family was breaking apart and I'd spent two decades doing nothing really but raising this family. 
and keeping it intact to the degree that I could. And when I couldn't anymore, and I found myself every other weekend uh, without children, and that's all I knew. So it was either literally, Tiffany, I felt like it was either die or I've got to go study something and work on myself. So I started a degree, a writing humanities degree at Hiram College, the weekend college (laughs) back in the day where non-traditional, aka old people who didn't get degrees traditionally would return to school later in life. And I'd spend every other weekend studying. Well, at the time, of course, I was single mom and I was hustling where I could hustle without a degree. And I was enjoying humanities and writing. I love to write. I love writing across genres. And I really would love to have devoted myself to that practice then. Like that was that was the feel, the call, the deep soul thing. But I looked at the checkbook, which was empty, and the daughter who needed me and stuff. And I just sold my soul. And so I got what I thought would be a marketable degree, a business management degree with an entrepreneurial minor. And when it came time, you know, every entrepreneurial program has these rocket pitch competitions, right? And so at the lovely age of 40, 41, I entered that at Hiram College with a bunch of other traditional students. And they all pitched genius ideas, like, I don't know, probably iPhone apps and things like that before the iPhone even existed. This is back in 2011. And I pitched Sweet Abandon. And Sweet Abandon was my fledgling organization to support orphans who were transitioning out of orphanages in Ukraine, where I had been in 2006 and 2008, and were leaving the orphanage, which made them the most vulnerable they'd ever been. While in the orphanages, they were supported by government funding. They actually, majority of them were not full orphans. They had family who would visit when they could. They just couldn't take care of them. But when these kids left at 16, 17, 18 years old, they were returned to the village of their birth without education, without any support. And there's a 90% failure rate between drugs, alcoholism, trafficked into the sex trafficking rings there, or suicide, like 90% failure rate. And so I pitched that this would never fly in America. We would never allow a 90% failure rate in any of our institution programs. And at the time, my heart was breaking because all of my children were experiencing this abandonment of a broken home and a broken family. So anyways, I pitched this very passionate and I won the freaking competition. Ah, That's amazing. That was, I don't know, $5,000 or something. And I went on and pitched this somewhere else. And it resonated with the audience because it resonated with me. Yes. But I couldn't make it into something that would support me. So I graduated with a stupid business degree that I didn't know what to do anything with at the time. (laughs) We were helping the orphans a little bit. I was speaking and raising some funds there, but still just really broken inside. And so I thought, well, I'll go to graduate school. I'm good at being a student. And I haven't figured out a big girl job yet. So I applied to Case Western because I found out they had a free master's degree if I made this fellowship thing. I thought, well, why not? I'll try it. And I got it. I was one of the first five of the Mandel Leadership Fellows that are funded by the Mandel family. And I thought, oh, this is because I'm so brilliant that they want to pay $80,000 for me to go get a degree. And I was like, social work sounds interesting. Okay. I think my dad was a social worker. I think I know what that is. I'll do that. (laughs) I love the logic. I love it. And then I sat in my first class where we had to learn active and reflective listening and empathy and sharing space with one other human being. Now, mind you, I'll take a microphone and I will stand before an audience and I will have my audience engaged and I am comfortable with a crowd who doesn't know me and isn't in my face. But one-on-one, I came undone. Mm -hmm. That's why I didn't get a social work degree. And my master's is not mad. And now they offer these fellowships for macro practice, which is my passion. But at the time, they only offered them in direct practice. So I got a two-year master's degree in social sciences, which every other university in the nation calls it a master's of social work. Case is unique only because they were the first university to give that degree and then never changed the name until now. But anyways, as I had to do clinical practicums, I'm put in an agency as a therapist because apparently I'm old and I had a lot of experience. And so they thought I could handle clients right out of the gate. 
And I sucked at it. <laughs> I really sucked at it, but not because I couldn't build the skills or you know have wisdom and insight. I mean, I got great reviews and ratings from my supervisors, but I felt like I sucked at it. Do you know why? Because I had to hold space for another human being. And like, we even had to videotape some of our interactions with our clients. And I thought in my mind, I am so connected. Like we're eyeball contact is good. I'm in. I'm sure my face says, you know, you're safe. Tell me your story. I watched the video back and I had like resting bitch face. Like I was bad. <laughs> so in the second year for practicum, I opted to do research at Adoption Network in Cleveland. And I ended up doing policy and research. And I really, really liked it. But then those jobs pay nothing. And again, single mom, 42 years old, graduating with a master's. I've got to get to work. I can't keep borrowing money from the government to study until I'm dead. So I need to work. Right, right, right. (laughs) So the highest paying jobs in social work was in child welfare. And I took my first position at Lorain County Children's Services in Elyria, Ohio. The, the BBC called Lorain County, Ohio, the heroin capital of the United States at the time. Our caseloads were marked by heroin at probably an 80% rate. Lorain County Child Welfare trains there. They only take master's level practitioners. I had a mentor in my program that said Lisa, and he was the former city administrator of Cleveland, as well as the head of of Cuyahoga County Children and Family Services. And he said, Lisa, if you can do this work two years, do this work for two years, you will interface with every other profession under the sun that exists. You will get more experience. Every day will be different. You will see the world from the lowest places. And you will understand how those places are impacted by the highest places. And he was right. So I came to California then to continue that practice for a few years and thinking that I could launch like you, you know, kind of a coaching consulting gig, which took me a lot longer than I planned on. But the face of child welfare has so impacted my life, the parallel process of my own inner child and healing journey, as well as what I see through the lenses of moms and dads struggling to love their children. It is my calling. And so now I get to train other social workers that, and that's such a better fit for me. I have the microphone again and I've got an audio, so it's a better fit. But I also believe with all of my heart that you cannot lead people if you haven't done the work that the people are doing. Yes, absolutely. Your company's mission speaks to transforming trauma first in our lives, like in your own life, and then in the lives of others. This is absolutely true. and something that seems to be so often overlooked by those wanting to help because they forget they need to help themselves first. But I love the adage, and I'm sure you've heard this, that hurt people hurt people, but healed people heal people. So what is the first step in the beginning stages of healing ourselves? Well, I used to say in my early days of doing therapy that self-awareness is 98% of the battle. I think the numbers are off, but I do think that's the first step. I'm not sure, Tiffany, if you or your audience is familiar with the Johari window. I'm not, but I'm sure somebody else is. But can you explain it to me? So if you just draw a square and you've got four quadrants in the square, okay? And so you have these parts of ourselves. And in the upper right-hand quadrant are what we call blind spots. This is known to others, but unknown to me. So those are the two lines on the X and the Y axis of this square. We have these parts of ourselves that are known to us and known to others. Our stories that are shared our flaws that we all acknowledge, our strengths that are known and acknowledged. And we have parts that are not known to others, but known to ourselves. And then we have parts that are known to others, but not known to ourselves. And there we have these blind spots. And I think on all of our journeys, I'm a huge fan of Father Richard Rohr, a Franciscan monk and mystic and teacher. And he wrote a book about the first half of our life and the second half of our life. And the first half of our life, this is butchering it majorly, but is about building, about creating or making or, or becoming. And then the second half of our life is about unbecoming or undoing all that conditioning that externally affected us. And so that's where I think the healing journey for all of us starts is with that awareness. 
You know, Maya Angelou says, the greatest agony is the untold story within. And so many of us carry decades of stories that have never been shared in safe places and spaces. And so they're not integrated. So the healing journey, I think it doesn't ever end, but let's pretend it ends, is integration, where all parts of ourselves are known to us and in safety to others. And we've integrated the things that have happened to us, whether wrong, right, neglected, abuse, whatever those were, we've integrated our memories into our present day selves so that we're not tripping over ourselves. And we have an understanding and a healthy love that we can then offer others once we've helped ourselves that way. So that's a really long answer to your short question. (laughs) But it is my why. You know, I believe we all have a why, why we exist. Every organization ought to have a why. And we exist to transform trauma first in our own lives. I have watched and trained so many social workers. You know, they're called to the work. You see them eager to help and fix people. And that's the problem because they haven't done their own work. And when you do your own work, you realize you can't fix anybody nor should you. People are not problems to fix. People are beings to understand. Mm, That is absolutely beautiful and so, so true. And I feel like this needs to be taught in every social work school, every program that is somewhat in the humanities. You need to be able to understand that. But I want to actually talk to you a little bit more about the storytelling in a safe space. And I was laughing when you were talking about the um, social work master's program, because I had so many friends that were in like school counseling and social work and all this stuff. And because at the time I was working in that space, they're like, why are you getting the degree that you're in? And And then they tell me about their classes. And I'm like, that's why I ain't sitting in a circle (laughs) talking about my feelings. Nope. (laughs) Yep. You and I both. (laughs) But they offered me because they offered me a fellowship. (laughs) You at least had that. And I always say that like I owed more in student loans than I did when I bought my house. Like that's crazy. So good for you on that scholarship. Oh my gosh, Tiffany, I've had on a couple of occasions, I've been out and about or whatever, you know, sitting, minding my business at a bar or restaurant or whatever. And I've had, you know, someone come up to me and introduce themselves and say, what do you do? And when I say I'm a social worker, you get this like the look. Yeah, the look. And then usually an apology. Oh, I'm so sorry. When I was more in that field, like I would get the look of, oh, so you take the kids away. And I'm like, no, Uh, because at the time I was working with offenders. And like, I would always say like, I'm much better at yelling than I am with like the crying people in front of me. So when you were talking about like that, that resting bitch face, oh, I understand. I understand. Because I'm much better with the angry people. Most of them were guys that, you know, just wanted to like burn everything, rape and pillage. Like I can handle that. Scream, swear, throw things at me. I got you. You start crying. I'm like, there, there, here's a cookie. Like, I don't know what to do. (laughs) We all have such unique skill sets and triggers, right? (laughs) Yes, yes. Oh my God. I've handled the yelling. And, you know, of course, you know, we make people angry in this work sometimes, or you're dealing in crisis situations, law enforcement, all of that. And you just hold it. I can hold it together, but it's not good for me because later I lose my, you know what? So yeah, I think that self-awareness piece shows up there too. I've watched colleagues be able to navigate both the yelling and the crying, and they're just super savvy and they're okay. They don't burn out. I don't get that. (laughs) They must have some super power coping techniques that they need to share with the world because, but of course, you know, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. We don't. Just because they seem like they've got it all together. I'm the oldest of eight children. And half the time, I think most of my life is a knee-jerk reaction from being raised in that environment. (laughs) I have six sisters and one brother. Oh, (laughs) Yes. Wow. I probably just traumatize half your audience. I'm so <laughs> sorry. It's a lot. Ooh. Okay. The trauma is being explained a little bit more now. Six sisters. Yes. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the beauty of that story is it's coming full circle too. So we're back to storytelling and circles. And yeah, this is not comfortable space for a lot of us, particularly those of us who have hid. Some of us are introverts, right? And so it's just naturally uncomfortable. But many of us have told on ourselves or told a story in what we thought was safe space, and then it bit us in the butt. And I'm fearful of that in the world of storytelling. And I've had a show. I did a show on LA Talk Radio last year called Wine on the Vine, and it was all about shameless storytelling. 
um, Wine, W-H-I-N-E. And now I'm promoting storytelling circles in senior centers and other places where populations have been isolated from the pandemic to a significant degree and inviting people into the circle. But I think when we carve and curate these spaces, we need to do it extremely thoughtfully and utilize our boundaries and set rules, group rules, and things like that, and always give people an out. I think people like you and I would feel safer if we knew we could tap out and run away at any moment. (laughs) Don't have to stay for the hour. Yeah. (laughs) Takes me back to like church when I was a kid and I couldn't escape. And I wanted so badly, like one, I loved the music and the parts of it so much, but then, you know, the droning and all the other things that came out of the pulpit, I'm like, get me out of here. So I have very much a flea response. I get that from you. Oh, yeah. I always say I need to be able to pull the ripcord and whatever it is, I need to feel like I have that power. And I'm glad that you organically were talking about the storytelling because that was one of the things I was going to ask you is how do you navigate that piece in a safe space when you can't even necessarily admit it to yourself, when you have just have these layers and layers and layers of trauma and you just don't even want to feel it yourself? I mean, because I can tell you, like when I first started doing my inner work, my knee jerk reaction was anger. And that's why I think I deal really, really well when it is like those angry men, because I understand what's underneath it. The crying I can't relate to. But how do you then deal with that first step of like, I don't want to feel it? How do you navigate that? This is such a good question. Carefully and thoughtfully is the short answer. Um, Lots of tissues. And what do you call it? A ripcord. Ripcord, yes. <laughs> ripcord under every seat. I have always been accused, and rightfully so, of being an oversharer. And I think that's part of my trauma response and needing attention so desperately in my younger years. Now, though, I take advantage of my comfort level there when I'm sitting in a group. And I do tell on myself in this way, I'm feeling extremely anxious right now. I don't like telling my stories because this 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 has happened in the past. And I'm hoping that in this group, we can understand that that's a trigger for me. And the person to my right, what might your triggers be? So we can understand and protect to a degree. You know, safety first, but that looks differently in every circle, in every conversation, you know, in every child welfare case. There was basic prime safety, like is child going to not die in this situation? And what can we do to increase the chances of safety in the future? But it looks differently. And I think that's where telling on yourself or authentically starting a conversation with I'm feeling blah, blah, blah is a door opener. I'm not going to ask somebody else to do something I'm not willing to do. Leadership 101. I'm also not going to hold an expectation for anybody to show up in any way that they're not okay with. So I think cultivating storytelling, I mean, I had guests that were very open to sharing on my show, right? So we would have a pre-conversation before we go on the show. If and when they felt comfortable, then we'd say, okay, good, we'll see you on Thursday and we'd go live on the air. And then I'd have this on air conversation and I wouldn't get half of what they told me on, on the Tuesday prep conversation. Yeah. It's different when the lights are on, it's different when you realize that there's an audience listening. And suddenly, what was safe space with one other person becomes very unsafe when you don't know who all's listening and what they're going to do with what you say. That was a big learning piece for me. Yes. And I think it's just that vulnerability. And I have a lot of stuff with that, of like the privacy and all those things and I can completely understand. But I think that maybe giving yourself permission to, it's okay that I feel the way I do. Before I started really consulting, I remember this nonprofit employee position I had. And it was looking at domestic violence spaces, like domestic violence like centers and looking at welcoming. And the contract that we had, the funder was like, make it universally welcome to everyone. I was like, that's an oxymoron because what makes me feel safe is contrary to everything you're saying right now. And so <laughs> it was just so frustrating. Yeah. And that's an impossible goal. Yes. It's like equality should never be the goal. Equity should be the goal, right? So how do we love the playing field in a circle of 10 people that have 10 very different trauma histories and reasons for showing up on any given day. And to the degree that, you know, like you said, 
I felt angry when I first started doing my work. Or if somebody looks at the room at the circle and says, I can't do this. You know what? They just got some self-awareness. Yes. That's the starting point. So if they leave that circle and never come back, they leave with new self-awareness that they can't do that. They don't feel safe. And there's so many healing journeys out there. There are so many wounded healers that offer you know, paths toward the inner sanctum of our souls. And there's some called transformative pathways. There's healing the younger you. There's all the trauma EMDR and some of the research based therapeutic interventions. You know, there's many, many pathways within. So there's no cookie cutter and there's nothing that's right for everybody or even a few people. So I think that my favorite social work value that took me the longest time to really wrap my mind around, particularly because I went into child welfare work, is the client's right to self-determination. And I think that's the piece that most of our religious organizations, change organizations, social justice organizations miss. That if people aren't doing the work on their own because they want to, it's not an authentic path anywhere. So it's not going to hold. What is your why? And that goes back to what you were saying about, you know, we may want to change and save this person that's in front of us, but unless they actually want to, unless you understand why they're doing this, I mean, is it to get their kids back? Is it to just be able to get into a shelter so that they can have a roof over their head and a hot meal? Like you don't know what their why is until you actually ask them. You don't know. And having come out of some of those relationships where I was holding on for dear life and I couldn't put a roof over my own head and I relied on the significant or insignificant other to do that and accepted a lot of what we would probably call abuse as a result. I mean, I had reasons. And I love what Dr. Gabor Mate says in The Wisdom of Trauma. He says, you know, addicts are problem solvers, right? Yes. Losing yourself in a bottle or two or three or whatever it is, whatever drug it is, solves the problem of pain. So we are resourceful by birth. We find our way out of pain. And many of us, until the pain to remain the same becomes greater than the pain to change, we don't change. And others watching, it hurts like hell, I'm sure. But we cannot cross over that threshold of client's right to self-determination and expect the change to be authentic and to stick. So when we do our own work, we always end up in self-love. And so when we love ourselves, we can then hold space for others and love them without that clinging or that forcing or that expectation of change. That's the space that I help others learn now that I'm learning it. And I think that's what heals our world. And we just, uh, this I know this isn't going to air until later in the year, but just what, three days ago, one of my country music heroes, Naomi Judd, took her life at 76 after battling depression for decades. And that hit me really, really hard individually because of a lot of things, a history of loving that family and understanding a lot of their story and dysfunction from my own experience. But also the song that they sang last together, which is Love Can Build a Bridge. And I'm not sure there's any other bridge that gets us crossed over into one another's lives, except for self-love and then selfless love towards others. That's beautiful. Lisa, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for the fantastic work that you're doing in the world and sharing your story with us. Thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. Thank you for listening to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. To stay up to date and receive free, valuable resources and action guides, you can find us at humanitarian-entrepreneur.com.